joined by my dear friend and colleague, Mark Marquise Harris Dawson. We have a uh, quorum. Mr. Clerk, why don't you go through the agenda and then we'll get started. Good morning, John White, City Clerk. Item one, statutory exemption, City Planning Commission and Plan Department reports and ordinance enacting restrictions on commercial advertising of cannabis, cannabis products, commercial cannabis activity, or businesses engaged in any commercial cannabis activity on signs. Item two, several motions. Deleting LAMC section 104.03 C8 and replacing with 20 years after conviction and release, whichever is more restrictive. Modifying LAMC section 104.20 to include that if a person resides in a low income census and his or her business is located within farther than 10 miles from their dis uh, is proportionally impacted area, he should qualify for inclusion within tier one of the social equity program. Also modifying LAMC section 104.20 relative to cannabis business located more than 10 miles away from the disproportionately impacted areas that any person who resides in a low income census tract would qualify for local hire. And amending LAMC section 104.20B to state that at least 20% of the amended disproportionately impacted areas shall be comprised of areas located within the San Fernando Valley and CLA report with recommendations for establishing a cannabis event organizer license and a temporary cannabis event license and on the issue of social consumption. Item three, motions, Busca and Englander amending LAMC section 105.01 to include within the definition of public park, any public park of any jurisdiction adjoining the city and Blumenfield Bond amending section 105.03B to remove expiration of the grandfathering for existing medical marijuana dispensaries on December 31st, 2022, relative to the buffer area around daycare centers and that the limited grandfathering continues on in perpetuity relative to the buffer area around daycare centers. Item four, Department of Cannabis Regulation and CAO to report relative to the resources necessary for pre-licensing inspections and enforcement against unlicensed commercial activity, the feasibility of using the private sector to assist the DCR in performing some of the functions and the movement of city departmental staff to the DCR, such as temporary loans of interim positions. Items five through 11, 10 are resolutions and CLA reports. Item five, relative to including the city's 2017-18 state legislative program support for SB 930 Hertzburg, which would state the intent of legislature to enact subsequent legislation to establish a state chartered bank that would allow a person licensed to engage in commercial cannabis activity under the Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act to engage in banking activities in California. Item six, city's 2017-18 state legislative program support for AB 1393 Friedman, which would require that a vehicle be impounded for 30 days at the owner's expense if the registered owner is convicted of reckless driving or for engaging in a speed contest while operating the vehicle. Item seven, including the city's 2017-18 state legislative program support for AB 279 Holden, which would allow re regional centers to adjust provider rates according to local minimum wage ordinances in order to continue providing critical services to individuals with developmental disabilities. Item eight, including in the city's 2017-18 state legislative program support for AB 1687 Bloom, which would expand the existing law to include a prohibition of a pesticide containing additional specified anticoagulants and prohibit the use of a pesticide containing one of those contagulants in California. Item nine, including in the CLA's 2017-18 state legislative program support for grant-oriented funding at continued or increased levels under the Transformative Climate Communities Program to address needs in disadvantaged communities throughout California and item 10, including in the city's 2017-18 state legislative program support for extending the Proposition 84 grant performance period for the Slauson Wall Park project from June 30, 2018 to June 30, 2022. Lastly, item 11, motion Wesson Englander Martinez instructing the city clerk to move the following items to the relevant policy committees for first consideration prior to council approval, liens and street lighting districts to the public works committee alcoholic beverage control licensing and rent escrow program motions to the planning and land use management committee and reward motions to the public safety committee. Thank you. All right, let's start off with uh, public comment. Uh, 
So I will have Mr. Previn, I think you've signed up for every item. You get two minutes and then one minute for the general public comment. Thank you, sir. It'll only take two minutes. That's the good news, or three, actually. But uh, item 11, uh, as you were just uh, recounting, is a very interesting item. Is this an opportunity to move hearings for liens, um, you know, public works, run escrow account, all to committee so that you'll be able to cleanse the meeting of public speakers going forward? Because if that, I don't know if that's what you're doing there, but that's a, that is an admirable proposal if that's your idea. You want to try to clean up the meeting. Uh, I'm opposed to that kind of thing, obviously. Um, here you have the uh, Transformative Climate Communities Program, item number nine. Appreciate that, sir. Uh, I would just direct you to the Intercept article that we wrote about blaming the uh, California wildfires on the homeless population, which is completely inappropriate. And you ought to take a look at that because uh, it was really kind of um, critical of the Los Angeles City Fire Department. And I think uh, we jumped too quickly on that Skirball fire or origination. It's nice to see Mr. Weezer arriving. Um, Item number uh, seven is simply punitive beyond belief. We are, this is if, if kids out in the valley are caught racing uh, and they're convicted of doing that, which is terrible. People get hurt. We definitely want to dis, d discourage that activity. But to automatically, if they're uh, caught doing so, uh, impound their vehicles for 30 days creates another liability for our city because now these people are thousands of dollars in debt. So I think that you should think twice on that one. Number five, obviously the people are very excited to get some state chartered banking for the cannabis industry. We appreciate it. And by the way, I want to just say to the group who's been working on that, we appreciate your leadership. This is a warren of confusing and often uh, hard to follow regulations. And yet you are, and Westall, look at him there, sitting there humbly. You've done a very, very good job of just kind of staying on top of it and trying to work through the, the blockages that come up 10 miles out low income. It's very confusing for people. We need to make exceptions. You need to protect your Prop D people, which I think people are annoyed by. People don't like that. They want to have an equitable, open, fair market. And then I think people will thrive. Um, in terms of private inspections for cannabis regulation, I know some one of you guys came up with that idea. Uh, that could be right. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that requires very careful study because who is the private inspector and which guy do you particularly favor there? Um, yeah, and there's your item three is the extending the protections. So in my general public comment, has that begun yet, sir? Yes. Oh, it's all been lumped in together. Okay. Well, I would just say thank you for putting all these rules items on one agenda early in the morning. It gives you an opportunity to push through items where people really don't have any idea before it hits council. And so uh, you're doing a great job of just kind of moving business along and keeping people out of the mix. Now, let's get back to what's the point here today, which is the cannabis regulation stuff. Once again, you've been doing a great job on that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, let's now vote on items before I call the next speaker. Mr. Clerk, we're going to vote on items 6 through 11. So, members, any questions on those items? I'm going to go general public comment. Just wait till I call you. All right. So we're going to go on item 6 through 11. There are no questions. We've been joined by Mr. Wezar. So on item 6, let's adopt the CLA uh, report and resolution. On item 7, we'll do the same thing, 8, uh, 9, and we'll do the same thing on 10. And on item 11, we'll adopt the recommendations of the chair. So without objection, so ordered. Okay, now I'm going to go back to uh, public comment. So I'd like to call up uh, Mike, Mike O'Gara, Gary, Donnie Anderson, Virgil, and Bill Watkins. Mike, good to see you. Hello. Uh, I'm Mike O'Gara. I'm a member of the Sun Valley Area Neighborhood Council. I'm here speaking for myself. New cannabis licenses are being issued and businesses are opening all over the city. However, there's still many illegal cannabis shops still op in operation throughout the city. We need to give the new businesses a good start, and that means closing all the illegal shops. The city needs to keep their promises to this new industry 
And that starts with enforcing Ordinance 185345, Section 105.06, which states in Sub A, it's unlawful to conduct any commercial cannabis activity in the city without a license issued by the State of California and by the city. Our neighborhood council has been asked by several licensed cannabis businesses in our neighborhood to take steps to help close the illegal shops operating in our boundaries. To that effort, we've written to several council members, the city attorney, and our local senior lead officers. This is a crucial time for this new industry and for the city. We need to close down all the unlicensed cannabis shops now. The police have advised us they cannot act to close them without a mandate from either the city council or the city attorney. Please give them a mandate to close the illegal shops. Thank, Thank you. you. And we're trying to get there. Next speaker, please identify yourself. Good morning, council members. My name is Gary Agus. I'm a member of the Sun Valley Area Neighborhood Council. Uh, illegal and or unlicensed cannabis businesses do not pay taxes. Enforcement is crucial at this stage. It will save us countless hours and resources in the future if we eliminate the illegal cannabis businesses now as opposed to later. Please allocate sufficient resources to ensure that the law-abiding, tax-paying cannabis uh, businesses thrive. Uh, at a recent press conference, the police mentioned the nature of serving a search warrant on one of these establishments is very lengthy. The process can be streamlined by the city council allocating the necessary resources, both financial and personnel, to cannabis enforcement. In earlier versions of the cannabis ordinance, 65 police officers were allowed for enforcement. We, we, need, we did feel that, that that was insufficient, and even that was dropped. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Donnie Anderson, the chair of the California Minority Alliance. One of the things we want to speak on is that the mediums, those are not parks. The little islands we wrote to the uh, rules committee, we need to make sure those are not a barrier for sensitive use. I don't know who would put that as, like a child or a kid or whoever's going to be there playing. One of our other points is we need to m help Ms. Packer get financing so we can pick up the pace on the licensing procedure. This is the Mecca. Whether everybody want to agree with it, California, the world is watching what we do. We going all around the world working with policy makers and they looking at what Los Angeles is doing. And another part is we want to help with the rogues, get the rogue shops closed because it's a, it's a problem in our community. Trust me. Thank you. Mr. Grant. Good morning, Council. My name is Virgil Grant. I uh, just want to echo what some of these speakers came up before me regarding the road shop, so I am in support of that. Uh, also, we definitely need to get uh, Ms. Packard uh, funded and staffed. Um, also, yes, uh, as Donnie Anderson said, regarding the open spaces, uh, the islands in the middle of the uh, street, they are not uh, parks. People will not play or sit in them. So. If we could have that removed out of the ordinance, that would be great. Also, I'm in support of opening up social equity uh, to Pacoima, Van Nuys, San Fernando Valley, and Panorama City, uh, the uh, east side of the valley. Uh, thank you, and have a good one. Thank you. Yes, sir. And then I'm looking for Kathleen B. No, but, but sir, Mr. Watkins, I believe, you're up now. Thank you. Hi, Bill Watkins, Clean Los Angeles. How are you guys doing? Morning. Uh, Mr. Weiss, are waiting for your office to still get back to me, unfortunately. The state. Must be busy. Um, regarding elections, um, I think it's the biggest corruption in our country is uh, how we do elections. And private money uh, leads to the NRA, which leads to mass murder at times. Um, I'm pass around one page of a start of a proposal to ban private campaign spending from our political life. Why not start in Los Angeles? Why not start here? It's the same thing I told the LAPD commission about lethal force policy. Why not start here? Change it here. Stop taking money from outside ent entities and let's have a nice public website we can do our campaigns on and nice public debates paid for by the public. We get these private entities in and they cause great corruption. My dad passed in December. That was the only political concept we agreed on. God bless you all. Let's change how we do this. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Good morning, my name is Kathleen Villarreal. I'm a cannabis CEO. I've had ambitions to enter the legal cannabis market for over six years now. In these six years, I've witnessed many hardships for females. Women have been degraded and used as sex symbols in, unre unre in unregulated shops. I know of women who have endured sexual harassment to maintain employment in unregulated unre shops. Women in all industries have had to work harder than the average male to maintain standards of professionalism. Women in the cannabis industry have had to acquire more resources than the average male to develop, to develop cannabis businesses, especially in areas of cultivation. The respect and treatment of female cannabis CEOs has been hard earned because often times our intelligence on the cannabis industry is undermined due to the lack of, it, uh, the lack of female presence in the industry. To further prove my statements, the DCR reports that of all the licenses that have been distributed up to now, very, a very small percentages, percentage of, of these licenses are to female-owned businesses. Uh, I think we need to make sure that there's a space for female-owned businesses in the cannabis industry, and I would appreciate if you guys would consider that in your regulations. Thank you. Okay. So... Uh, I, we have speakers on specific items, so I want to try to get as much as, of that out of the way as I can. So do we have a Jessica Ellington, Rafael Gonzalez, Ebony Ellington, please come forward, Elma Rodan. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, my name is Jessica Ellington. Um, I would like to thank the Honorable Councilman, Mr. Wesson, for allowing us to speak on this issue. Um, I was born and raised in Chesterfield Square in the District 8th, uh, the, the 8th District of Los Angeles, and I'm a business owner in my community and survivor of the drug war within the same community. And our goal, myself and my sister, is to open a women-owned and operated medicinal cannabis boutique and patient care facility that contributes to local art programs for children as well in the community. However, the very tight real estate market in Los Angeles for zoning and compliant retail locations, the 10-mile limitation creates um, a high applicant rate within a limited portion of the city. So I know that this, the SEP program's intent is to afford opportunities for women like myself that grew up in the defined areas of Los Angeles to participate in our city's cannabis industry. And that 10 mile limitation creates a severe obstacle within our uh, ability to open our patient care facility. I'm very grateful for the SEP program um, that is opening these opportunities for lower income participants. And I jumped at the chance to make a difference in uh, the lower income community as my sister and I, well, we've raised successful capital and we're just hoping that you can extend. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good morning. My name is Ebony Ellington. And as my sister just spoke, we were raised in Chesterfield Square, um, very uh, affected by the war on drugs. I am uh, a disabled veteran. I ran away to the military to escape um, what was going on in the community. And I had a question about um, veterans and the SEP program and if there would be um, something extended to veterans as well. Um, and then also um, the 10 mile radius does restrict our ability to open up business um, within the community. Um, it seems to be oversaturated and we wanted to open up arts programs for youth and to help to build up the community that we grew up in. Um, so thank you very much. No, thank you for coming down. Next, and then I want to Gilbert Moran if you please come. Good morning. My name is Rafael Gonzalez, and I'm with First 5 LA. And so on behalf of First 5 LA, I want to thank you, the Rules Committee, for your continued leadership on the city's social equity program and for recognizing the opportunity that exists to support child and youth development in Los Angeles. As a public entity that advocates for real <laughs> meaningful change for young children and parents, we're especially excited to be part of a movement that represents both child and youth development spheres coming together on this issue. We continue to raise the significance of a community reinvestment fund and its inclusion in the social equity program, given the unique opportunity the city of LA has to bring much needed resources into our communities. We believe that the city should commit a good portion of cannabis revenue into communities most affected by prior cannabis policy and enforcement. Most importantly, by putting our children and youth first, we're changing their future by strengthening our families and our communities. 
we ask that the, that the committee look into different ways that the city can commit 20% of cannabis revenue to quality programs and support Thank services you. that focus on youth and children. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good morning. My name is Elmer Roldan. I'm representing the Brother Son Selves Coalition. We are a coalition of 10 organizations across LA County working uh, to improve uh, relationships between youth and schools and other government agencies. And today we are urging the City Council and the City of Los Angeles to direct 20% of its community reinvestment fund towards youth programming, specifically targeting ages 0 to 24, and to invest them in the communities that have been mostly impacted by the war on drugs. We thank you for your leadership, and we urge you to take the right action. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. So if I can get... Uh, Tomer, Tamar, uh, Felicia Carbajal, uh, Gabriel Vidal. Yes, uh, sir. Good morning, early morning. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Gilbert Mora. I'm with Rethinking Access to Marijuana, a coalition of public health agencies that are looking to educate the public on, you know, how to protect youth from the harms of uh, use of substances such as marijuana. Um, I want to commend the the council on this brilliant advertising <laughs> ordinance that you've come up with. My only worry is that you put 800 feet for advertising, but how's that gonna affect businesses that are within that 800 feet? Are th is their advertising gonna be limited or, or how's that gonna work? Because it kind of seems like a little bit of a conflict. So it, I, I, I would recommend that you just move the businesses 800 feet and keep the, the same number for both of them, but uh, I leave it up to your wisdom to figure out how to figure that out. Thank you for coming down. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tomer Graciani. Um, I wanted to kind of remind the council a little bit that <clears throat> I think the California values and economy relies heavily on the small business, you know, the mom and pop, the cottage industry. And I feel like that part of uh, the population has been kind of ignored by the rules and regulations because of the high cost to entry to the market. I don't think that uh, those smaller businesses actually have a chance to get into the market. And I also think that many of those problems also affect minority-owned businesses. Uh, a lot of them overlap. Uh, I think that also for the addressing the war on drugs, what I'd like to see is LA following suit of San Francisco and San Diego in expunging all misdemeanors and felony, uh, cannabis-related felonies, rather than having to wait for people Thank to petition the courts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so do I have uh, Gabriel Vidal and uh, Roca Armenta? Yes. Hello, my name is Felicia Carbajal. I'm a San Fernando Valley value-based business owner, organizer, activist, and voting constituent of CD4. We are here to reclaim the conversation about social equity as it relates to the legalization of cannabis. As an activist with decades of experience in the Latino community, LGBT community, the medical marijuana movement, and criminal justice reform, I have watched the conversation about cannabis and social equity devolve into a conversation about business. While this may be understandable to most, it comes at the expense of social equity, public health, and cultural competency. This is a conversation about radical social justice. Under the new law, there are genuine concerns about access to affordable medicine, fair economic opportunity to communities ravaged by the war on drugs, past drug, past drug arrest numbers, and selective criminalization of youth in these same communities. We, the concerned citizens of the San Fernando Valley Cannabis Coalition for One, pledge not to allow that to happen. We are here for radical reparative justice. We look forward to this next chapter, including the Valley. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Yes. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Gabriel Vidal, and I'm a youth organizer with Inner City Struggle, as well as the Brothers on Self Coalition. Um, you know, I, I work with young people, high school youth specifically, and families uh, out in the east side. And, you know, historically, the east side uh, is a community that has been impacted by irresponsible policy uh, on the war on drugs impacting families of color. 
And so today I'm here to urge that the city council really look into alternatives such, uh, and, and, and really research alternatives like such as San Francisco, Santa Cruz, Colorado, that really look at reinvestment uh, funds uh, for youth and families and also to really consider uh, committing 20% of the cannabis revenue to supporting young, young people and families of color. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, good morning. My name is Roque Armenta. I'm also with Inner City Struggle. Um, we work with young people and families in um, Boyle Heights and the Greater East Side. Um, we definitely see the need in our community and how young people and their families have been impacted by the war on drugs. And we're definitely advocating for the Community Investment Fund to go towards, uh, in particular, young people 0 to 24 to support them um, in reaching their goals and supporting um, their families' dreams. So we're asking for 20% of the cannabis revenue to go towards uh, 0 to 24 young people and programs to support them. And we thank you for your leadership on this issue so far. Thank you for coming down. Patrick, be the last speaker. Good morning, uh, Patrick McFarlane, uh, representing Crystal Stairs, and on behalf of the Lapai Coalition, uh, we just believe that the city should commit a good portion of the cannabis revenue into communities most affected by prior cannabis policy and enforcement uh, by, by putting our children and youth first. Uh, we ask that this committee look into different ways the city can commit 20% of cannabis revenue to quality programs and support services that focus on youth and child development, specifically between the ages of zero to 24. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I need a Lucas, Esteban, Aria, Sarah, and Christina, Sarah Armstrong. Hi, my name is Lucas. Um, I just wanted to come up and tell you guys, thank you so much for all the work you're doing. And um, I wanted to bring you to your attention, even though it didn't really show here today, um, all over the city, people are getting together and talking about the social equity equity plan and participation. I think getting here at 8.30 in the morning might be a little tough for some people, for you guys to see that it is catching, up, catching on. And also, I've, I've been getting a lot of calls from all over the country, and, and everyone's so proud of you guys. And uh, it, it, it's transcended. Social equity has transcended cannabis. It's, 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 it's people believing in the system again. So thank you guys for all the work you do, and, um, and the country appreciates you. Thank you. Sarah? Good morning, sir. Good morning. I am Sarah Armstrong, Director of Industry Affairs for Americans for Safe Access, which stands in proud partnership with the Southern California Coalition. Our organization is very grateful that Ms. Packer and her small team were able to process and issue 99 retail licenses in a, roughly a month's time. ASA has been involved in regulatory actions all over the country, and since 2002, and we're in a position to tell you that this is an extraordinary achievement. We ask that the city council fully fund her with staff and money. Coming up next are the patient providers. They are many more numerous than the Measure M folks, and we must license them quickly because they are the mechanism by which the dispensaries receive manufactured goods and cannabis. Uh, patients depend on this, and all of these people that you'll be licensing were originally part of these collectives. Um, we fully also support uh, extension into the valley for social equity, but we would ask that the percentage of ownership not fall too low because then it's not really ownership Thank at all. Thank you. Next. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Esteban Araya. Um, being a uh, part of, uh, being born and raised in uh, CD8 and uh, 14 all my life. Um, watching the social equity present itself uh, has been extraordinary. I can just say thank you to the people that are you know, putting this together. I want to continue to work with the community leaders, continue to bring community awareness with what's going on, and uh, just continue to be part of this process. It's been, it's been extraordinary. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Love yes. You, Ocean. I'm back again. Uh, we're struggling with land use. We're struggling with real estate. Struggling with small business. 
Mayor Garcetti says he's for small business. I'm Native American, we're woman owned. We are trying to find our path. We've exposed ourselves. I'm losing faith in my own city mm -hmm. because I am here showing up, but I'm not being honored. And I have an honorable business serving your socioeconomic disadvantage. And I'd like Kat to get staff so she can help me because I, we need some help here from our city, small business, social equity. I'm Native American. I got thrown down the stairs by the DEA. But I was in Kansas, so I don't qualify here. And I understand that. But I'd like some small business help because we have no money. We put it all forward, 250 k down the tube, two homeless families, if we can't resolve this with our city. Please honor us for exposing ourselves. Thank you, Christine. OK, Brian Cunningham. And Kathleen V, you also signed up for items, so if she's still here, she'll be behind Mr. Cunningham. Yes, sir. Good to uh, see you. Good to see you too, sir. Uh, Brian Cunningham, uh, son of the uh, late uh, president of APAC and uh, California Minority Alliance uh, member and uh, council member, David S. Cunningham, Jr. Um, I'm just here to express my support for the uh, council support for uh, SB, the, the state bill with regard to the state uh, chartered bank, and I think it will be a good move as far as uh, providing more legitimacy to the uh, industry as well as protection for the uh, employees all the way up to the chain to the uh, to the uh, the state and well, businesses at large. Thank you. I may give my best to the rest of your family. Thank okay. You, Is Kathleen still here? You also signed up. So Kathleen, you have another minute. like to publicly state but in addition I just like to also re reinstate that um, I would really appreciate if we considered some kind of percentage minimums for female owned business distribution of licenses um, like I said I've, I've spoke with the DCR and I've asked them how, how many of these businesses have how many of these licenses have been distributed to women owned businesses and it's a very small percentage and so um, please take those into consideration yes thank you yes Okay, that closes, Mr. Clerk, public comment. All right, so let me get staff come forward so we can begin a conversation on this issue. We're going to now deal with, uh, I think, items one through five. So don't be shy. So, Ms. Packard, I think we're going to, first of all, it's good to see you. Good to see you all. Happy New Year's to you. But I, maybe we start with you, and uh, whatever is more comfortable, we can go, you know, you can just go through the items, or we can do item by item, however, whatever you think is uh, easier for us to process. Thank you, Council President. It's great to see you, too, and uh, Council Member Harris Dawson and Council Member Weezer, it's, it's great to see you. I understand that. This is the first time that the department has been back in front of uh, council since the ordinance have passed and been approved by the mayor. So what I'd like to be able to do is to give a brief update on where the department is, uh, status update, uh, and then I'll follow your lead through going through the items. Go right ahead. Uh, first and foremost, I, I have to thank folks who have been a part of this process. I want to thank the mayor's office, various council offices, uh, the effort that uh, the city staff has taken in moving this conversation forward has been tremendous. Uh, we've been able to work collaboratively with uh, LAPD, our fire department, city attorney, CAO, uh, folks in the mayor's office, city planning, the, the list goes on. This is a huge effort uh, and folks are working together to move this forward. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Everyday Angelinos and, and community members for their patience uh, as the city uh, and department move this conversation forward. Uh, and the patience of business owners uh, who are in the middle of what is uh, currently and will continue to be a complex transition uh, from an unregulated market to a regulated market. Uh, and 
last but not least, those folks who continue to show up to support the social equity po program. Uh, it's so important. It's an integral part uh, of our program, and so I appreciate the folks who have been a part of this conversation thus far. Uh, as folks know, the uh, mayor has signed the cannabis ordinances on December 19th, and in short order, uh, a department of three did everything that it could to line up a process uh, that was going to be first-time regulation for the largest uh, local jurisdiction to take this conversation on. And so I have to take a moment to uh, thank my staff, uh, Victoria and Brian. Uh, we are a small team, but a mighty team. Uh, that being said, we do need additional resources to move this conversation forward responsibly. Since the department began accepting applications for Proposition M priority processing on January 3rd, uh, a number of things have occurred. Uh, we have issued temporary approvals to 101 businesses to date. Uh, we know that there are around 42 businesses that are eligible, uh, individuals who have 2017 BTRCs but have yet to submit. Uh, and then we have a number of individuals who have uh, submitted their applications, uh, but their applications are pending further review. Uh, it's likely the case that there are ownership disputes that are going on or address uh, changes are, are being sought out. And so we are working collaboratively uh, to develop a process to allow these folks to move forward uh, as well. As folks may know, it is not just uh, the City of Los Angeles's Department of Cannabis Regulation that businesses have to be authorized uh, from. There are also three agencies at the state level that are issuing uh, state temporary licenses to these businesses uh, per state law. The Department of Cannabis Regulation, as the local designated contact, uh, has 10 calendar days to respond to state inquiries uh, to provide local authorization. To date, uh, the department has received over 600 requests uh, from state agencies to provide local authorization to businesses. Uh, in December, we received 109 requests uh, and issued 72 approvals. In January, we received 396 requests uh, and gave out 304 approvals. And uh, since the beginning of February, we have received 97 requests uh, and given out 41 approvals. To date, we only have 21 pending responses. And again, this is with uh, a staff of three. In order to move this conversation forward responsibly, there's a lot of infrastructure that still needs to be built uh, within the city between departments, uh, various memorandums of understanding, uh, the social equity program. Uh, we need to create infrastructure and funding in order to move that conversation forward. Uh, but I am pleased with the progress that the department and the city have been able to make. Uh, there is no reason why we should not be able to lead the nation uh, in our regulatory program, but in order to do that, uh, we're going to need leadership, we're going to need commitment, and we're going to need resources. So I appreciate the leadership, commitment, and resources that you all have put forward thus far, uh, and look forward to continuing to work with you all to move this conversation forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You know what? Let's, let's go straight to the item that deals with some uh, increase in staffing. So uh, up, up to this point, it's my understanding that we have collected more revenue than anticipated. So it's your, your, your uh, department has been doing better than we thought. Yes. Uh, originally, the department was uh, given a budget of $1.3 million, and to date we have collected uh, over $2.2 million uh, in uh, licensing fees, and we have uh, around about $800,000 in outstanding invoices. Uh, so it is likely uh, that our revenue projections uh, through June will be $3.5 million. Okay, so you have a staff, a mighty staff of three, correct? Yes, sir. Is, uh, is that a, does that include you? Uh, that does include me. There, <laughs> there are uh, folks who have been on loan uh, on an interim basis, and, and they have been uh, an extreme help uh, to, to the department thus far. Um, but for folks, staff members who are within the department right now, we, we have a staff of three. Well, let me just say, I mean, we, we all, Mr. Weezar, Mr. Harris Dawson, and myself, other members of this council and the mayor's office, I'm sure, we knew that this was 
we were breaking new ground and things were going to happen that we didn't anticipate and things that we did anticipate were going to happen wouldn't and things of this nature. Uh, so I understand there's angst in the community, but I think we all just have to take a deep breath and calm down and realize as we're rolling this out, there's going to be uh, hiccups and pimples and, and, and problems, but we want to act as quickly as we can to try to make adjustments. Members, to me, it's, it's very important that we do not put Ms. Packard in a position to fail. We need to put her in a position to succeed. And when she succeeds, the, uh, the, the city benefits as well. So where it relates to this item, the need for additional staff, I would uh, suggest that, that we move forward quickly and then we will stay in contact with you so we can monitor what's happening, the progress of things are moving, moving smoother. But uh, I, I just anticipate that we're, we're going to be in, this is going to be an e-ticket ride, you know, for a while, and we need to uh, uh, be aware of that. To the industry, I know we've had individuals that have come down and they've talked about restrictions and distance requirements and things of this nature, and I get that, I understand that. I think if you want to see flexibility in those items, then it's, the, it's going to be up to the industry itself. When you conduct your business in a very professional manner, if people are not hanging around, if you are real genuine partners with the community, when you elevate the comfort level of the people that you coexist with, they will be more supportive, which will then give us more flexibility to make adjustments and, and, and whatever other things that we have to adapt to. So we're all in this together, and like one of the speakers uh, referenced earlier, I think it was Mr. Anderson, I do believe that eyes are on us, all eyes are on us, and I do believe that we have a responsibility. So uh, I, I, I would guess that this uh, committee would be supportive of giving you more resources. So why don't with that, that, so let's eliminate that item and we'll go on to the other items. Do, uh, why don't we have everybody that's at the table, starting with you, Matthias, uh, introduce themselves so people will know who's here from what uh, department. Yes, sir. Matthias Bartan from the Chief Legislative Analyst's Office. Cat uh, Packer, Department of Cannabis Regulation. Phyllis Nathanson, City Planning Department. Jason Colleen, City Planning Department. All right. Okay. So we, we've dealt with, I believe, at least four. But let me see. Members, do you have any questions on that item uh, in particular? You know, item four where it relates to staffing. Well, Kat, Ms. Packard, go on. And if you could just walk us through some of the other. Sure. So I, I, I know that one of the uh, other items uh, to be considered are uh, amendments to the social equity program, uh, specifically to allow access for folks who are uh, in the valley. Um, I think that as a part of our larger regulatory program, there are amendments that are going to be uh, needed to be made to our ordinances. Uh, and of course, we want to be able to approach uh, our amendments to our social equity program uh, very conservatively. We want to, I specifically want to make sure that uh, in these amendments that we don't uh, dilute the meaning of, of social equity, uh, remembering that this program was specifically designated to acknowledge and address the harms that individuals and communities uh, that specifically were uh, experiencing the war on drugs and marijuana prohibition and enforcement. Uh, I am fully supportive of uh, taking a more inclusive approach uh, and allowing uh, and making sure that folks uh, in the Valley have access to the program in a meaningful way. So I look forward to working with council uh, to make those amendments happen. Uh, that being said, I, I do think that we want to uh, make sure that we're continuing to get input from the community uh, as we move this conversation forward. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think is going to be critical to the development and amendments to the social equity program as it's, as it's been mentioned, uh, 
previously is that folks are having a hard time finding real estate. Uh, and so one of the things that the department is interested in doing is finding a way to uh, leverage the social equity program individuals and their qualifications to allow them to, to get some type of uh, letter or notification, some official document from the city uh, that folks might then be able to show to a property owner to say, I've been pre-approved, I've been pre-selected, um, I, I am essentially pre-qualified in order to participate in the program. Um, so I'm fully supportive of the more inclusive option to include the, the valley uh, and look forward to working with council on and making sure that that happens. You know, before I call on Mr. Weezar, maybe we should just uh, also, I wonder if, if, if legally there's a way to possibly loosen some of the requirements where it relates to distance and things of this nature for uh, individuals and in small companies that qualify for the social equity program. I'm, so I would like for you to investigate. I'm not saying that we would do it, but I would like to know if that's feasible or not. Mr. Wezar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what we have before us today is an examination as to whether San Fernando Valley would qualify under our existing criteria. It's not saying that we are going to do it, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, given that, Mr. Chair, um, I know the last time when we got our report, there was only one zip code in Boyle Heights that qualified, and I was a bit surprised because uh, I, I grew up in Boyle Heights. I now live in the zip code that was selected uh, as qualifying now, and I was a bit surprised that other parts of Boyle Heights weren't selected, just given anecdotally what I've seen growing up and still living there for over 49 years. So I, I'm asking if we could, um, I prepared some language, Mr. Chair, that we also examine uh, as along with examining San Fernando Valley, that we examine the Boyle Heights community to re-examine if other zip codes within Boyle Heights would also qualify. And, um, and uh, certain areas of downtown Los Angeles that uh, for many years uh, we've had uh, impacts of the war on drugs here as well, um, in certain parts of downtown, and uh, I was a bit surprised as well that that wasn't uh, selected as well. So we could add those two areas as well, Mr. Chair. And I have some language to that effect. Okay, I, I do think that we it's we it's it's no problem at all for us to take a, a different another look a broader look a deeper uh, dive, but uh, and I support that. But I do think that it's important that we not uh, forget what the social equity program is actually all about. And then when you look at these uh, statistics, the reason why certain areas qualified. Uh, for this program is because they were specifically the areas that were target targeted and that's why those numbers are different so I but I, I This has to be a citywide program and we have to figure out a way to include every you know area uh, so yes, I would su would, would would support that but I, I just want to make sure that we're very careful as we move forward so if you submit those, uh, uh, that language, Mr. Weezer, then we'll, we'll move that on. Mr. Harris Dawson, any more questions? Do, do uh, Ms. Packer, do you wanna speak on anything else? The, the, the other uh, representatives from the two different departments, you guys have anything that you wanna say are, are things challenging for you do we need to look at helping you do the job that we need you to do I mean if so now's the time to to say something you're good all right you're good you want to wrap it up Ms. Packer so uh, while I have folks here Year and I, I had the opportunity, there are a number of other departments who are participating in this regulatory framework that are gonna need resources as well, uh, namely our fire department, uh, city attorney, different folks have asks uh, in through the, the normal budget process 
Uh, but in order for us to do this collaboratively, it's not just the department that needs additional resources uh, citywide. We're going to have to look uh, collectively at how these resources uh, are, are put together. Um, one of the things that I'd like to, to say is that I know that folks have been reaching out to the department via email, via phone, uh, and one of the reasons that we're you know, seeking these additional resources is that so we have the additional capacity uh, to address community members uh, and their concerns. Uh, every day we get to the office and our inbox is full, uh, our, our, our phone inbox is full, uh, we have a, a number of emails that we just don't have the capacity to respond to and I can understand for uh, community members and for businesses who uh, are going through this transition that that is extremely frustrating. I want to let folks know that we, uh, we receive their uh, emails, we receive their phone calls, and we do our best to, to get back to them, uh, and we look forward to uh, building capacity in order to make sure that we're doing that in a timely fashion. Do you think you'll be able, if we make adjustments uh, now, that that will be a focus uh, of, of you know, your attention as we, if we give you more resources? Because it's important to us. Uh, I, I know you're inundated, but it's important for the community to know that we're listening. And the only way that they're going to know that is if we at least contact them. And we want to make sure that we give you the ability to do just that. Absolutely. That is a, is a priority of the department. Uh, we intend to build out our public relations arm. Uh, I know that we've spoken specifically about the department uh, moving forward with a public information campaign. Uh, the department being able to do various uh, community engagement activities. We've taken a number of speaking requests. We've met with a number of neighborhood councils, a number of community-based organizations, faith organizations, uh, youth development organizations already. Uh, and so I know that we'll be able to bring that uh, capacity up to scale with these additional resources. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So, Mr. Clerk, uh, w without objection, uh, I'm going to recommend that we adopt the recommendations of the chair for items one through four. And on item five, we'll adopt the CLA report and resolution. So, if there are no questions, Mr. Weezer. And uh, number two has amended? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Number two has amended. So, uh, without objection, those uh, items should be deemed approved. Committee members, uh, on your recommendations for the chair's recommendation for number two, the second recommendation should be amended to state instruct the Department of City Planning and DCR, substituting planning for CLA. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. So with that said, is there any other business before this committee? None, sir. Okay. This committee is adjourned. Thank everyone for coming. <laughs>